Today, our speaker is Katja Wally, who will talk about the most fundamental question regarding dreaming. Why do we dream? Katja is a dream researcher located in Turku, Finland, and was very involved in the development and empirical testing of the stat simulation theory and the social simulation theory. Another topic she's interested in is dreaming and anesthesia. She's also a professor of cognitive neuroscience at the University of Skörfte in Sweden, teaching consciousness research and evolutionary psychology. She loves scuba diving, hiking, whales, and especially seals. Uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Michael, and welcome everyone to this 40th ISD uh, anniversary research talk series. So this talk uh, is titled, Why do we dream? And the short answer really is, I don't know. We don't know. Dream science doesn't have an answer to this question as of now. Uh, there are many, many different types of theories about dream function and some theories that state that dreams do not have a function at all. And within a 30 minute time period, it would be impossible to review all the theories and do justice to all these theories. So instead, I'm going to focus on the question that why do we disagree on the answer to the question, why do we dream? So we, what are the biggest hindrances uh, on, on answering the question, why do we dream? And uh, I'll start this by, by thinking what would be required in order for dreaming to have a function. Um, first of all, we would really need an, a, a definition on what we mean when we talk about dreaming. And surprisingly, even though progress has been made, there are still some disagreements upon the definition of what are we talking about when we talk about dreaming. Um, another question is when we talk about dream function, that we are sometimes a bit unclear by what we mean uh, by function. So what we also need is a definition for function that everyone can uh, sign up for. Uh, and if we can find a definition for these two, then when we think about dream function, what kinds of properties dreams really should have or dreaming should have in order for it to be able to have a function? And here we also need uh, some agreement. And only if we have answers to the, to the uh, three points above, um, then maybe we may be able to agree on what the function of dreaming could be. So uh, let's start by looking at what do we mean by dreaming? And first of all, it's quite important to, to define dreaming as a subjective experience, and by that definition, distinguish dreaming from the neurophysiological uh, level the sleep stages that are defined by neurophysiological phenomena. Because dreaming then as a subjective experience needs uh, a level of explanation that is independent from neurophysiological phenomena and sleep stages. And we know that subjective experiences occur throughout the night. Uh, sometimes when we wake participants up from sleep, they recollect nothing. They say that they were absolutely not dreaming. This happens in all sleep stages, although it's uh, more likely to get reports of no mental content earlier in the night. Uh, it's also possible to get reports when people say that I'm sure I was dreaming. I'm sure there was something, but I can't remember any specific content. Sometimes the content is really simple, fragmentary, like thoughts, single sentences, somebody saying something, you thinking something, and also these thought-like experiences occur in all sleep stages throughout the night. We may sometimes have this fleeting fragmentary imagery without any storyline or any narrative. And then we have these fully immersive hallucinations where there is a long narrative that progresses uh, over time and changes. And also these fully immersive hallucinations 
these full-blown dreams we can have in all sleep stages, although they are more common in, in REM sleep and especially towards the morning. But again, we can have immersive hallucinations, full-fledged dreamlike phenomena already when we fall asleep. So there is this huge variation in, in richness and complexity of subjective experiences across the night. And uh, this means that the broadest definition for dreaming includes all of these subjective experiences during sleep. Some single uh, uh, fragmentary thoughts of fleeting imagery to full-fledged uh, dreaming. And the narrowest definition for dreaming, in fact, focuses on these immersive hallucinations that amount to a simulation of the real perceptual world. And many have conceptualized dreaming as world simulation. And the earliest account that I have come across is from 1876 uh, by Sully, who defined dreaming as a group or series of groups of vivid imaginative representations of sensory, motor, and emotional experiences, which simulate the form of real perception. 70s, Frederick Snyder uh, defined dreaming as a remarkably fateful replica of waking life, uh, folks as a multimodal perceptual simulation or a credible world analog, nearly perfect simulation of what life is like. Uh, Charles Tart, an active complex world simulation process. Harry Hunt, a relatively true to life reconstruction of, of waking life. Uh, Antti Revansua has uh, talked about dreams as virtual reality and as a realistic simulation of the perceptual world. Um, and, and so on. So uh, um, there are many scholars that have defined dreaming as world simulation. And this is something actually that has started to unite the field. Uh, but then the question is that has this kind of a convergence in defining dreams as simulations led to a unified concept of the nature of dreams? So do researchers really agree that dreams are world simulation? So yes is the first answer because this world simulation definition is nowadays widely accepted. And in fact, it has led to the simulation theories of dreaming, which I will talk about uh, uh, later on. But also no, in a sense that uh, while these majority of current dream theories have adopted this idea that dreams really are world simulation in different theories, the concept of world simulation is interpreted differently. So what does it really mean that dreams simulate the perceptual world? And in the, I would call them strong simulation theories, the idea is that dreaming is this multimodal, temporally progressing, realistic hallucination that's disconnected from sensory motor interactions. And that dreaming faithfully replicates perceptual experiences and episodically simulates how we experience the waking world. And this definition implies that dreaming is not similar to imagination or mental activity or, or mind wandering or daydreaming or, or uh, these spontaneous uh, internally generated thoughts. Even though there are similarities between dreaming and other stimulus-independent thoughts, there are also important differences. For example, uh, in, during dreaming, we lack insight into our true condition, while during mind-wandering or daydreaming, we are still connected uh, to, the, to the world uh, outside of us, and we realize that we are, are daydreaming or mind-wandering. So the kind of first take-home message here is that that conceptualizing dreaming as world simulation may seem to have united the field of dream research, but then again, even the simulation theories vary as to how they define world simulation. And if we cannot agree on the definition, it becomes difficult to contemplate on the function of dreaming. And then the, the second difficulty that 
uh, dream science faces uh, is the concept of function. And there are many theories that use the term function, but don't really define what they mean by function. And uh, usually in, in natural sciences, when we talk about function, we refer to a biological function. And then when we talk about biological function, well, nothing makes sense in biology except in the light of evolution. And in fact, the biological standard is the only standard of functionality that's relevant when we try to analyze why our brain, why our cognition, why our mind, why our dreaming is organized in one fashion rather than, than in another. And uh, in order for a, a trait or a characteristic uh, to have a biological function, it has to be an adaptation. So it has to be a characteristic that was selected for during evolution because it enhanced the chances of survival or chances of reproduction in our ancestors. That is, this, this characteristic somehow increased the fitness of our ancestors or ancestral species to humans. And it is also possible, or actually it's very likely, that humans have many, many characteristics that are not adaptations, that have not been selected for, that natural selection has played absolutely no role in shaping this characteristic. But these traits are spandrels. They are byproducts of evolution of some other characteristic rather than the direct product of selection. So for example, these uh, uh, poles have an important function in supporting a structure while these triangles are a byproduct of having this kind of a, a, a structural um, form. And uh, characteristic cannot be a spandrel and an adaptation at the same time. In some cases, it's possible that a characteristic has evolved as a byproduct of a trait that was under selection, but in itself, it has no function whatsoever but later it becomes useful. It somehow starts to increase the fitness of the bearer of the trait, and then it becomes the target of selection, and therefore some spandrels can become adaptations. For example, in dinosaurs, uh, some of those species had feathers. Those feathers were important for thermoregulation, and then later when birds evolved from a, a specific species of, of dinosaurs, the feathers become adopted for, for flying purposes. And uh, so if we talk about the function of dreaming, then we are basically talking that dreaming is functional in the evolutionary sense. And it can be functional in the evolutionary sense only if it has promoted our ancestors' inclusive fitness. So in order for dreaming to be an adaptation, it must have solved adaptive problems in the ancestral environment whose solution somehow tended to enhance survival and promote reproduction. And then again, if dreaming would not be an adaptation, it would be a mere pie product that wasn't selected for or it wasn't selected against during evolutionary history. But it was somehow dragged along because of the features that dreaming is tied to were selected for. So the idea here is that sleep is an evolutionary adaptation and dreaming is somehow a byproduct because during sleep, we cannot turn our brains off. Our brains try to make sense of the neurophysiological features, but in itself, dreaming serves no function. And when we talk about biological function, it's important to note that the word function can also be used in the sense of an invented function. And these invented functions are basically ideas, values that uh, um, are, are derivatives of personal and cultural uses that we think dreams might have for individuals. And these invented functions are not inherited via genetic mechanisms, but by social learning. And 
the only thing we actually give to the next generation is our genes. So if dreaming would have a function, it would have to be something that's already coded into our genes. Uh, so these invented functions can never be transmitted via biological or genetic mechanisms. Uh, so the take home message here is that if dreaming has a function, then that function is necessarily a biological function. So if we can agree on the definition of dreaming, and if we can agree on, on what function means, then what kinds of properties dreaming should have in order for it to, to be able to have a function? And I'm going to list three. Uh, realistic nature, that it really dreams realistically simulate uh, the, the perceptual waking world, that we have a lack of insight during dreaming and that dreaming can have causal effects on brain and behavior. In a sense that whatever the function of dreaming might be, if it has a function, that function must manifest during waking hours. It must have an effect on how our brain functions during wakefulness and on our wake behaviors, because selection does not operate in a sense uh, on behavioral characteristics during sleep. But let's first talk about perceptual realism. And if we look at dreams, they are organized similarly to our waking consciousness, and they really do seem to faithfully replicate our perceptual experiences and simulate how we experience the waking world. So, so dreaming really builds this kind of a offline self in a world model where we have an active dream self, and this active dream self is, is capable of self-reflection, logical thinking, uh, uh, guiding its own actions, thinking of consequences of its actions. So there is volitional control. And in our dreams, we have a comparable body image to our waking self, uh, most of the time, not, not always. And this dream self, uh, this embodied dream self is surrounded by a visual spatial world and sensory perceptions, much like what we have during wakefulness. And that is where the virtual reality metaphor comes, that both dreams and the everyday phenomenal world may be thought of as constructed virtual realities. Because of course, also during wakefulness, it is our own brain that creates a simulation of the world around us. And my wake simulation of the world is different from your wake simulation of the world. So we never have a, a direct access uh, to the external uh, reality, but it's always through the model that is built by our brain. What is important here is that in order for for uh, dreams to have perceptual realism and in order for us to take our dreams for granted and go along with the story and act uh, 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 reasonably in that story, we need to have a mechanism that makes sure that we don't realize that we are dreaming while we are dreaming. And this lack of insight really prevents us from realizing that we are dreaming and anything that happens in the dream, we take for granted. We take that it is as real as giving this talk right now. So having a dream is being immersed in a dream. And while you are dreaming, you really cannot tell the difference between your dream world and a wake world. And if we look at how the perceptions that we have in our dreams and the different types of activities that we do in our dreams correlate with brain activity. Is it so that the same uh, neural networks that are involved in creating perceptions during wakefulness and relate to different types of activities correlate with the same uh, types of uh, perceptions or activities in our dreams. And in a quite nice study conducted by Francesca Siclari and colleagues, they looked at brain activity uh, with EEG just before an awakening, and they analyzed what happened eight seconds, six seconds, four seconds, and two seconds before the awakening, and then correlated this activity to dream content. And if just prior to an awakening, the dreamer was looking at a face or perceived face-like stimuli in the dream, this 
fusiform face area became activated. And this is the area that activates when we look at faces during wakefulness or when we perceive face like stimuli, like when we are looking at a smiley face or a house that has windows and a door that look like a face. And when people dreamt of moving about just prior to awakening, the superior temporal sulcus uh, showed higher degree of activity. And also during wakefulness, this area is related to movements. And when uh, the dreamers uh, heard speech, Wernicke's area that is important in speech comprehension showed a higher frequency activity than in dreams where speech was not uh, present. So dreams are also perceptually realistic on the neural level. Lucid dreaming also allows us a model to study perception and how dream perception relates to wake perception. And in this study, uh, Stephen Laberts and colleagues asked people to track a horizontal line with their eye movements from left to right and right to left. And this is how the eye movements looked during wakefulness when we can have these smooth pursued eye movements. And if we look at panel C, this is also during wakefulness, but now the people were asked to close their eyes and imagine following the straight line from left to right and right to left. And when people imagined following the line, their eyes actually were not doing this smooth movement, but there were these rapid saccadic eye movements, the similar types of eye movements, uh, a little bit what we have during REM sleep. And then they had participants who were able to have a lucid dream do this task during a lucid dream. So in the lucid dream, when the participants followed the line, their eye movements showed this smooth pursuit pattern similar to wake perception and quite different from wake imagination, suggesting that the visual quality of REM sleep imagery is, is more similar to waking perception than to imagination. Dreams also have motor realism. And again, we can use lucid dreamers to study this uh, because we, we can study this uh, uh, real time uh, correlation between dream activities and brain activation patterns. And in this study, uh, Martin Dressler and colleagues uh, had a participant sleep in an fMRI scanner and do a fist clenching task during a lucid dream. Uh, so the participant's task was to clench their left fist for 10 seconds, release, and then clench their right fist for 10 seconds. And when we clench our, our left fist, uh, the opposite uh, hemisphere of our brain uh, lights up in the motor area. And when we clench our right fist during wakefulness, uh, the left hemisphere motor area lights up. So this is how the brain activation patterns related to fist clenching look like during wakefulness. And this is how they looked when the participants conducted the task in a lucid dream. So we can see a similar activation pattern, although it's not as, as strong as during uh, wakefulness, uh, suggesting that uh, on the neural level, uh, dreams also have this motor realism. We can also ask the question of when we do actions in our dreams, how do those actions relate to how our body moves in the physical realm. Um, and for example, there has been the traditional assumption that in non-REM parasomnias like sleepwalking, the sleepwalking episodes are not associated with any dream content. So sleepwalkers are like zombies that get out of their bed, do things without having any mental content whatsoever. But in fact, over 70% of adult patients uh, with non-REM parasomnias, especially sleepwalking, can recall at least one uh, dreamlike mentation that's directly associated with their, their behavior during the episode. And there are also case reports and observations in a sleep laboratory that show that there is this dream behavior uh, isomorphism. And here's a video 
that shows a sleepwalker. This is a home recording. The woman gets out of the bed, uh, having a dream where the baby fell from the bed, and then the, the mother uh, uh, raises her arms to, to, to catch her. And also there is a condition called REM sleep behavior disorder. And normally when we are in rapid eye movement sleep, uh, we have uh, uh, no muscle tone. So basically our skeletal muscles are paralyzed, but in REM sleep behavior disorder, this loss of muscle tone doesn't occur or it's only, only partial. And in fact, when patients are awakened immediately after uh, this behavioral episode in, in uh, REM sleep behavior disorder, they quite often report dream content that is congruent with the behavior. And here's a video of a patient with REM sleep behavior disorder. And uh, in this episode, the, the patient is, is, is having a heated argument uh, with his neighbor. He's yelling in French because the, the patient is French. Uh, but uh, you can clearly uh, hear what he is uh, uh, saying. And uh, we think that often these REM sleep behavior disorder behavioral episodes are violent and they relate to negative dream content, but they can also be nice and calm and quiet and relate to positive dream content. For example, this, this uh, man used to work as a manager on a building site and he had a dream where at the end of the day, he was uh, relaxing and, and smoked a, a cigarette. And because he has a pulse oximeter on the finger, which lights up in infrared <laughs> camera, it actually really looks like he's uh, smoking a cigarette, but really he isn't. So uh, the last uh, kind of requirement, uh, what, what dreams should have in order to have a function is that dreams should have causal power. And here the question is, can dream simulations cause changes in our brain, in our neural networks, so that survival and reproductive success would be enhanced? And um, this evidence comes from waking mental practice. Jackson and colleagues did a study where they told participants to do a foot tapping task. So there was a specific sequence that participants learned uh, uh, and tapped their feet. And then they also had to do this task without any physical movement, but only imagining it. And when they executed the foot tapping task, and when they imagined it, they saw similar changes uh, in the brain and uh, uh, in, the, in the cerebellum. So also just imagining doing a task causes changes in, in uh, brain activity and brain uh, structure. And now if waking mental imagery training causes these types of changes in the brain, then, then real actual physical training why couldn't perceptually realistic dream simulations have the same effect, especially because our dreams are really perceptually much more realistic than mere imagination that we can do during wakefulness? And even a more interesting question is, does dreaming about specific things change behavior on the following days? So not only that dreams would have causal powers for brain activity, but they would really shape our behavior uh, in, a, in a way that our survival and reproductive success are enhanced. And there are very few studies that have looked at dream content, uh, specific dream content, and then uh, behavior uh, the next day. And one of those studies was by Selterman and colleagues who collected dream reports over two weeks from people who were in a committed relationship and they noted that certain types of dream content about one's own partner, especially infidelity, jealousy, and conflict, so negative dream content about one's partner, were associated on the following days with less intimate feelings toward the partner and more conflict uh, with the partner. 
and also in participants who were high in interdependence, so had a really tight relationship, when they had sexual dreams about their own partner, the following days they felt more love and intimacy towards their partner. So it seems that dream content really can affect our behaviors uh, on the following days, but uh, there are very few studies on this. Uh, so the take home message here would be that dreaming is perceptually and motorically a realistic hallucination, and it has causal powers in the physical realm. Also, the take home message here was that the same brain mechanisms that participate in weight experiences participate in realizing dream experiences. And these mechanisms can be modified by dreaming, and this can lead to behavior modification on the following days. So if we think that these properties of dreaming can support functionality, then what could the function of dreaming be? Is it somehow, uh, uh, is it conceivable or even plausible that specific kinds of dream contents could have enhanced fitness uh, in our ancestors? And here we come to the simulation theories, some of which are functional and some of which are non-functional. And the functional simulation theories say that the function of the simulation is directly related to the specific contents that we dream about. So specific types of things are selected for simulation and dreaming about these specific types of contents may have enhanced fitness. So if we look at hundreds and thousands of dream reports, the most frequent dream contents are the most likely candidates for reflecting the specific functions of dreaming. This means that dream content should be selectively uh, uh, simulating specific types of content and dream content should be biased if we compare dream content to the content of our what happens to us during wakefulness. And then the non-functional uh, um, simulation theories suggest that dreams have no function, but they reflect our experiences, our thoughts, our concerns, our personal response styles, our personalities, and so on. And the most frequent dream contents correspond to dreamers' internal and external wake environment. So things that we experience, things that we think, things, things that we ruminate on uh, are repeated in dreams. Uh, so dream content is not specifically selective or biased, but it's determined by the dreamer's uh, uh, internal uh, uh, thoughts and external uh, wake experiences. And now the functional uh, theories include, for example, the threat simulation theory that says that dreams are specialized and focused on simulating negative and threatening events to enhance survival. Social simulation hypotheses, there are several of these, suggest that it's the positive interactions with others uh, that uh, are the target of simulation so that we may benefit from practice uh, of uh, making allies and friends, uh, uh, playing the social chess, mind reading others, uh, uh, mentalization skills and such could be uh, improved by dreaming about social relationships. Kelly Palkley has talked uh, about dreaming as play. So any types of behaviors that are useful for a species uh, survival could be practiced in dreaming, like, for example, play behaviors in, in uh, mammals. And there are several other functional simulation theories that make broader suggestions about what dream content should be simulating. And then the continuity hypothesis and the neurocognitive theory are these non-functional simulation theories. Why we disagree on the function of dreaming relates to that these different simulation theories have different background assumptions about dreaming. So is dreaming identical to wake perception or is it more similar to other uh, stimulus-independent thoughts like daydreaming and mind-wandering? And here is an important difference because dreams, if, if they are conceptualized as being on the same continuum as, as, as uh, waking mind wandering or daydreaming, then we need to broaden what is the function of daydreaming and mind wandering. 
uh, there is ambiguity about the definition of dreaming. So while simulation theories use this world simulation metaphor or, or definition, there is ambiguity what, about what they really mean by world simulation. And there are many non-simulation theories, theories that don't directly state that dreams are world simulation, uh, which still assign a function for dreaming, for example, the emotion regulation and reward theories. We disagree on the definition of functionality and talk about biological and invented functions uh, ambiguously, but only biological functions should be considered when we talk about the function of dreaming, because those are subject to, to biological genetic transmission, while these invented functions need cultural transmission. And the simulation theories disagree as to how dream content is biased. So what exactly is being simulated? Some theories are quite specific about simulated content, like the threat simulation and the social simulation theories, but others are very broad and general, suggesting that basically any skill uh, that is important for us could be practiced in dreams. Of course, for empirical research, the more specific the claims, the more specific the predictions of the theory, the easier it is to empirically test. And in fact, a good scientific theory needs to have both explanatory power, so it explains phenomena, but also predictive power, so it makes predictions about what we should find in dreams. And uh, this is where we currently are when it comes to uh, dream function. We are like the blind man looking at the elephant, and we disagree on what the function is. But what is needed is a theoretical unification. Uh, and although dream science has progressed drastically during the past 20 years, it's not yet theoretically united. And this hinders hypothesis generation. Uh, this hinders theoretically informed empirical research. And what dream science needs is a paradigm shift where people can come to the same page. So uh, thank you very much for your attention.